Okay, so hello and, and welcome to the webinar called Using Ground Penetrating Radar for Locating Unmarked Graves. I thank you for attending today. I am Greg Johnston. I'm with Sensors and Software, a GPR manufacturer based in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The first thing I'd like to say is that we all agree that my topic today is a sensitive one. The recent news about unmarked graves at First Nations residential school sites in Canada is fresh in everyone's minds. And I'm sure that many of you are attending today's webinar with some sort of association to this story. There are also endless stories about missing persons, unsolved murders, cold cases, and war atrocities from all around the world that relate to the topic of unmarked graves. It's important to realize that when we talk about unmarked graves, we are dealing with people. We are dealing with someone's loved one. There's obviously a strong emotional aspect to this work. Today, I will be talking about human bodies. The only way to get through this material is to put our scientist hats on as best we can. I'll talk about bodies, clothing, and coffins as targets. These targets will have, a, will have certain physical properties that are important to the detection with GPR. I will talk about what happens to buried bodies and coffins as the years go by. It's not an easy topic to discuss, but it is necessary for the work that needs to be done in Canada and in many other areas around the world. Work that will be done by many of you in my audience. The second thing that I will say is that I am not in any way, shape or form a forensic anthropologist. I am sure that there are audience members today who are. And when, when I inevitably make a mistake or make a bad generalization, I will ask on you guys to correct me to minimize me spreading misinformation. I am a GPR application specialist with more than 30 years of geophysics experience at hundreds of sites in more than 40 countries. A lot of that experience is using GPR for the number one application for GPR, buried utilities. However, over the years, I've done some GPR surveys and training for people using GPR to find buried bodies and forensic evidence. I'm also relying on our customers, several of whom have provided me with data, data images, and information about graves both in cemeteries and clandestine graves. I'm indebted to them for their help. All right, my plan for this talk is I'm gonna talk about GPR theory, basic GPR theory and some of the limitations. Talk about GPR reflections because that's what the data really is. Uh, we'll talk specifically about cemetery data, data you collect in a cemetery. We'll also talk about GPR signal attenuation, which is important. And then we'll get in more of the task at hand, which is talking about detecting bodies and detecting graves. So we'll talk about some of the factors in detecting those. We'll talk about the GPR systems that are typically used for the unmarked graves application. And then I'll talk a little bit about GPR uh, data collection, uh, grid surveys, and the type of outputs that you get. We'll also talk about pseudo grid surveys, which if you don't know what a pseudo grid survey is, you'll have to wait and find out. Uh, then we'll get into the challenges of data interpretation. This is not an easy application for GPR and talk about some of the challenges that you're gonna have doing it. And then we'll also discuss briefly uh, the types of systems for surveying large areas, which is part of the issue with, with this particular application there's typically large areas that need to be covered. And then I'll summarize, uh, summarize the talk and we'll go from there. Okay, let's talk about some of the basic theory and limitations of ground penetrating radar. I apologize, I know a bunch of you are gonna be uh, probably GPR experts. So I gotta drag you through a bit of this, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you learn something and perhaps something you've never heard before. Okay, GPR is a technology that uses radio waves to create an image of the subsurface. The term ground in ground penetrating radar is a loose term. 
Basically, any material that is non-metallic will allow radio waves to penetrate into it to a certain depth. This includes soil and rock, but also things like concrete, wood, plastic, fresh water. These are all things that GPR will penetrate into. As we will learn, the depth of penetration, the depth that the signal can penetrate into the material varies depending on the properties of the material. So GPR has a transmitting antenna on one end and a receiving antenna on the other end. The transmitter sends a pulse of radio frequency energy into the ground. Here's my little animation that shows that. Buried targets are identified by the signals they reflect back to the surface, which are detected by the GPR receiving antenna. The GPR records echoes coming back for a period of time, equivalent to depth. The vertical strip of data under the GPR system is called a trace. Now notice in this picture that the system is on wheels. It's designed to move and collect data in lines. As the wheel rotates a few centimeters, it triggers the transmitter to fire again and another trace is collected. The vertical traces are combined to create a cross section of the subsurface along the survey line. One of the most powerful features of GPR is the real time view of the data. You can see objects on the screen as you cross over them, but the data is also saved on the data logger so it can be replayed and processed. This simple animation shows how an inverted V or a hyperbola is created when transversing over a point object. The apex of the V is the closest approach to the target. So that's where it's actually located. After you have crossed the object, you can pinpoint its location by pulling the GPR system backwards until the backup indicator is on top of the hyperbola. And so here we see uh, reality superimposed on the GPR data. So in this particular case, a pipe buried in the ground is at the apex of the hyperbola. That's where it's actually located. So this is GPR in a nutshell. And as I said, I'm sure most of, a lot of you already know this. Conceptually, GPR is like a fish finder or an ultrasound. Waves are sent into the water or a body and they reflect from objects in the subsurface to locate them. The difference is that fish finder and ultrasound technology uses sound waves or acoustic waves. GPR uses radio waves that travel much, much faster. There are many applications for ground penetrating radar. This, here are some examples of those. As I say, the number one application around the world is really locating utilities. That's a big problem. We've all heard about uh, gas explosions and things like that, and that's usually caused by improper locating. So uh, the strength of ground penetrating radar is its ability to find non-metallic utilities. We're also involved in concrete scanning, if somebody wants to drill a hole into a building, they often want to make sure that they're not cutting something important. So scanning the concrete with GPR is important. We can also scan roads. We can tow systems. We can geotechnical and environmental work in the upper 10, 20, 30 meters looking for problems involved with construction and that sort of thing. Uh, probably most people have heard of ground penetrating radar from archaeology. Uh, exciting finds. You know, everybody wants to be an archaeologist. Ground penetrating radar also gets involved in ice and snow. If you've ever watched ice road truckers, those types of shows, they have to measure the thickness of the ice before they can put a 40 ton truck on it. And GPR is, is used to do that. We have a whole system called Ice Map devoted to that application. We get involved in agriculture and forestry because we can image tree roots and into wood. Uh, there's military applications for ground penetrating radar, especially on un unexploded ordnance. Uh, GPR works very well in hard rock. So it's, it's um, a lot of people use it in mines, hard rock mines, looking for voids and fractures. And of course, we also get involved in forensics and law enforcement. So looking for buried evidence of, certain, of various kinds.
And so those are all the areas that we get involved in and even a few more. So it is a very versatile technology because you can look into the ground with it. You can look underneath a surface and see something that's invisible. So let's watch a video of how GPR is depicted in Hollywood. You may recognize the movie. Turn, shoot the radar into the ground, and the bone bounces the image back. This new program's incredible. Mm. A few more years development, and we won't even have to dig anymore. Postmortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. And look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrist. It's not... Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae full of air sacs and hollows, just like a bird. First of all, this is not a GPR. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Steven Spielberg thought that GPR systems were too boring for his movie because they don't make any noise as they collect data. So he replaced it with a seismic system so it, he could at least have the sound of an explosion. When I was in the movie theater in 1993 watching this scene in Jurassic Park, I was the only one who burst out laughing. However, what is depicted here is unfortunately what many people think is possible. As a company, we spend a lot of time educating people about GPR technology and setting the proper expectations of its capabilities. So here's the reality of ground penetrating radar. The ground is usually a complicated place. GPR does not just find the target you are looking for. In other words, there's no dial on it that says gold bars and it will only find gold bars. I wish, but we haven't developed that yet. GPR images can contain a lot of information and can be confusing. Some targets don't reflect. Some soils quickly absorb all the GPR signal. GPR cannot determine the composition of a target. There goes that idea of finding gold bars, darn. GPR data must be interpreted based on the context. Even the experts can be wrong with that interpretation. We are a ways away from AI, artificial intelligence, automatically interpreting ground penetrating radar data. So these are the realities of ground penetrating radar. So let's talk more about it. Let's get into some of the theory and talk specifically about the data and GPR reflections. Okay, a lot of you will know this, and I mentioned this at, at first in the first slide there, one of the first slides. So we've mentioned hyperbolas, and hyperbolas are important because they're a fundamental GPR response that you will see almost every time you use a GPR system. Hyperbolas are the GPR response to a point target in the subsurface. Think about a buried cannonball or crossing a linear target like a pipe, a coffin, or a body at a right angle. You will often see a hyperbola in the data. The GPR image of the subsurface is not a photographic image of the subsurface. It is a fuzzy, distorted image that does not have the resolution of your eyes. That is very important to remember. A point object looks like a hyperbola because the GPR energy does not just go straight down like a laser beam. As you can see here, it spreads out in a cone shape. This means that GPR signal is going out ahead of the GPR system and also out behind it. Consequently, the GPR signals that go ahead of the system can bounce off an object in front of the system. This is what forms the left side of the hyperbola. As the GPR gets closer to the object, that path gets shorter and shorter. That makes the tail on that side come closer to the surface. Eventually you go over the top of the object and that's the closest you ever get to it. 
And so that is the apex, that's the highest point of the hyperbola. Then as the GPR goes past the object, again, there's energy going out behind it, still bouncing off the object, but getting further and further away. And so that's what forms the other side of the tail. And hopefully this animation and my disjointed explanation kind of uh, explains that. In short, GPR hyperbolas are a fundamental response that you're gonna see in the data. To cut to the chase, here's what coffins look like in a GPR survey. Here are eight coffins spread over 40 feet or about 12 meters with one every five feet or 1.5 meters or so. You can tell the exact position and you can see that they vary in depth by about a foot or so. There's some very shallow objects as well, which are probably associated with, with the cemetery, although I can't tell you exactly what they are, perhaps urns or something like that. With a bit of velocity calibration, we can get a very good estimate of the depth to the top of each of these coffins. So this is what GPR data looks like. A coffin, as you know, is usually rectangular in shape with a long axis and a short axis. If you collect a line across the short axis of the coffin, you will usually get something resembling a hyperbola, depending on the shape of the coffin. If you collect a line along the long axis of the coffin, you will see a longer flat response with hyperbolic tails on the ends. Usually when we look at data from cemeteries, we tend to see the first type of response, the hyperbolic response. The reason is pretty simple if you look at the next slide. Headstones usually prevent data collection along the length of the coffin. Most of the data images that you will see in this presentation were collected perpendicular to the long edge of the coffin. But be aware that when there are no headstones as unmarked graves, uh, do not have by definition, you may see GPR lines along the length of the coffin. So watch out for the flat response shown in the previous slide. Now that we know what to expect a reflection to look like in our data, let's go back to my opening animation and ask a question. Why does the GPR pulse reflect from the subsurface object? In this case, it's a concrete sewer pipe. GPR waves reflect when there is a contrast of materials, specifically a contrast in a material property called the dielectric permittivity. If you are interested, you can look up the details of this property. But in my mind, the details of the property or even the name is not that important to know. It is only important to understand that a change in this property is what causes GPR energy to reflect. We understand this concept intuitively because every day we look at objects and know that the reason we see them is because they contrast with the air around us. The light reflects off them and into our eyes. GPR waves do the same thing in the subsurface. Here's an animation that shows the idea of how a GPR wave reflects from a boundary. The material above the interface at 1.5 meters has a different dielectric permittivity than the material below. That is why the GPR energy reflects at the boundary bet between them. And what I want you to notice is some of the energy reflects and some of the ener energy transmits through. And if you watch the video, the, watch the animation, the energy that transmits through doesn't act, it acts like the boundary was not even there. It just goes right through it, but some of it reflects. And that's the key part of ground penetrating radar. At any interface, some GPR signals reflect and some signals transmit through. And we are familiar with this. Think about looking out a window at night. 
we can see the reflection of the woman in the glass. So we know that some light is reflecting. We can also see the lights of the city through the glass. So we know that some of the light is transmitting through. What controls how much energy reflects and how much transmits through? The reason this information is important for GPR is because we know, or we should know, that the more energy that reflects back to the surface and is detected by the GPR receiver on the surface, the better chance we have of seeing that subsurface boundary or object. So again, what controls how much energy will reflect? The answer is the magnitude of the contrast of the materials. The bigger the contrast, the more energy that reflects. Let's look at the dielectric permittivity values of common materials we will encounter in nature and out in the field. Dielectric permittivity uses the capital letter K for short. So you'll, you will sometimes hear me call it K. Just think of it as K for contrast and don't think too much about the spelling. In this table are the K values of some typical materials. You can see here that except for metal on the bottom, most materials have a dielectric permittivity between one and 80. That's air and water. Everything else we tend to encounter, except for metals, is in between. Ice is three, dry sand is five, granite is six, limestone is eight, wet sand 25, clay 40. So you can see the numbers. Everything in nature has a dielectric permittivity value. So the amount of GPR energy that reflects from an object depends on the contrast between the K of the object and the K of the surrounding soil. The bigger the contrast, the more GPR energy that reflects. That is called the reflectivity. And in case you're interested, you don't have to be, uh, here is the formula for calculating it. Let's look at some examples of the GPR reflectivity in some different scenarios. Okay, let's start with an easy one. A dry soil with a K of five to a metal object, for example, a buried metal pipe. Metal has an infinite dielectric permittivity. So when you do the math from the formula, it ends up having 100% reflectivity. This means that 100% of the GPR energy that hits a metal object reflects and none of the energy transmits through the metal. This is the reason why metal objects are the easiest objects to detect with GPR. Now let's talk about GPR detecting a non-metallic object, such as a rock. K of rocks is six, and the K of dry soil is five. Even before we do the math, you can see that there is not much contrast between five and six. So we can predict that the reflectivity is going to be small. Sure enough, when we do the math, the reflectivity of a rock and dry soil is 5%. That is only 5% of the GPR energy that hits the rock reflects back to the surface. And 95% of that energy transmits through. The result is a very weak reflection from the rock. Something like the weak hyperbolas shown here in the data image. Let's look at another situation, rock to air. Rock has a K of six, air has a K of one. The reflectivity or of a tunnel or a cave or a cavity or a void is 42%. That's a lot of energy. That's, that's a good amount of energy. It's way more energy reflecting back to the GPR receiver on the surface. So the conclusion is air filled objects have a high reflectivity and are very detectable with GPR. And so this is what the GPR image looks like in this situation. So clearly we get very strong responses from the interface between the rock and the air in the tunnels. Okay, if we look at the dielectric permittivity table again, note that water has a very high dielectric permittivity. It's 80, 
It's much higher than dry soil, which is five. Dry soil has a low K because the pores between the grains are full of air with a K of one. That pulls down the K for the soil. When you replace the air with a K of one in the pores between the grains with water that has a K of 80, even though the pore space is a small percentage of the total volume, it increases the K value for that new wet soil. And in general, the presence of water in soil has the largest effect on the K value for that soil. Notice the range of values. Dry sand is five. Wet sand is 25. The only difference between those two is the presence of water. If you go into a swampy mixture, like sort of a quicksand, you can even get values of K that are more than 50. Simply put, the more pore space with water in it, the higher the K value for that soil. Okay, so recall that a rock in dry soil only has a reflectivity of 5%. Okay, let's see what happens to the reflectivity of our rock if we add water to the soil. So here, uh, here we are adding water into the soil. Saturating the soil with water increases the K from five to 25. So the rock is still at six. The wet soil is now 25. So the reflectivity of the rock goes from 5% to 34%, making it much more detectable. The implications of this are important to note. It means that if you're looking for an object with a low K value, such as a rock, such as an air-filled object, it becomes more reflective if the soil is water-saturated soil. All because of the larger contrast that the water in the soil creates compared to the object in the soil. Let's talk about the opposite situation. Detecting a water-filled object in a dry soil. Not surprising, it's all about contrast and the result is, is the same. So we have water, we have the buried jug of water with a K of 80. We have dry soil with a K of five. The reflectivity, 60%, very high. Lots of reflectivity easy, should be easy to detect this object. And sure enough, it is. Here's an example of a buried water jug buried at a depth of about two and a half feet. And here's the GPR response. So a very strong reflection stands right out in the GPR data. Here's another example where one of my colleagues actually, uh, during a training course with a forensics customer a few years ago, uh, they buried a case of bottled water to see the response by the GPR system. So on the right side, we see the strong response as predicted by the contrast in K values between the water, the case of water, and the soil that surrounds it. Now let's look at detecting that same water-filled object in a wet soil. The reflectivity of a water-filled object with a K of 80, a wet soil with a K of 25 is 28%. So it's dropped from 60% to 28% because we saturated that soil with water. Less contrast, less reflectivity. So here's everything we just talked about in one slide. In terms of reflectivity, metal objects, are the best at 100% reflectivity. The next is air-filled objects in a wet soil at 67%. Then comes water-filled objects in a dry soil at 60%. The hardest objects to find, air-filled objects in a dry soil at 38%, and water-filled objects in a wet soil at 28%. Why are they harder to find? Less contrast, so less reflectivity. 
GPR data is really an image of subsurface contrast between objects and the host material. This is an example of metallic and non-metallic utilities, this image that you're looking at here. But it makes the point I'm trying to make. When we see strong reflections, we now know that this means a large contrast, and there are several strong reflectors in here, hyperbolic reflections. When we see weak reflections, we now know that this means less contrast. This object here is definitely weaker, and we know that it's probably because of the contrast of the material. These hyperbolas here are very weak. There's an object there. A hyperbola indicates an object, but the strength of the hyperbola indicates the contrast. So we know that these objects have very little contrast with the soil. So it doesn't mean we should ignore weak reflections. Depending on the situation, they may be from targets. They may be from targets that we're looking for. Okay, let's take this theory and apply it to controlled GPR data from a cemetery. Okay, this is how we're gonna learn about graves. In this case, we're looking uh, at graves in a cemetery, which are usually marked graves, but not always. It's surprisingly common to have unmarked graves even in established cemeteries. Here's another example of the responses from coffins in a cemetery. Note the spacing of the coffins, the slight variation in the depths of the coffins, and the variation in the reflectivity of the coffins. You'll notice over here, this, this I mean, looking at it, this must, must be a family plot or something. You have four coffins all close together, but the strength of the signal from them varies. This one's much weaker. If we look over here, there's three in a row and the middle one looks much weaker. And so we are gonna see those variations in the reflectivity of coffins. Now, why do coffins have such strong reflectivity? Well, believe it or not, the reflectivity of a coffin is the same situation as the air-filled tunnel we talked about earlier. Air with a K of one is always going to provide a strong contrast with the soil. And that is good news for our search for unmarked graves. Okay, here's the situation. A coffin contains air with a K of one. If the soil is dry, it will have a K of five and the reflectivity of the coffin will be 38%, very detectable. If the soil is wet, the news gets better. The air inside the coffin has a K of one and the wet soil has a K of 25. The reflectivity, 67%. A coffin in this situation should be a very strong target. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the examples that I've shown you so far. There's another factor to consider. Coffins differ. If you read up about the history of coffins, you will learn about lead-lined coffins and even metal coffins. And we know that metal will provide very high reflectivity. Here's an example of two coffins that based on the reflectivity must differ in composition. Because although they're at the same depth or approximately the same depth, the GPR reflection from the one on the left is much stronger than the one on the right. Assuming that the material above the coffins is the same or very similar, the difference in reflectivity must be because of the composition, a compositional difference between these two coffins. Perhaps this is a lead-lined coffin and this is a regular wooden coffin. Uh, you know, certainly, I don't know in this particular case, it was collected in a graveyard in a cemetery and uh, we don't know for sure. There was no information about the type of coffins. So I hope you see how important contrast and reflectivity is to, is to finding buried objects with GPR. Now let's talk about another very important factor for our search for unmarked graves with GPR. 
signal attenuation. I know you know this because it's intuitive. GPR signals get weaker as they travel into the subsurface. But let's just make sure that we understand what is really happening. GPR reflections get weaker with depth. The dominant reason is signal attenuation. The depth that GPR signals travel into the subsurface before they are completely attenuated or absorbed is controlled by the electrical conductivity of the soil. We know this more commonly as clay is bad for GPR, but the underlying cause for people to make that statement is that clay rich soils generally have high or relatively high electrical conductivity. Here's an animation that shows what happens to the GPR signal as it travels in materials with different electrical conductivities. On the left, low electrical conductivity, typical of sandy soils, results in slower attenuation of the signal and a lot of reflected energy making it back to the surface. We know that we can only detect an object in the subsurface with GPR if the energy reflects and makes it back to the GPR receiver on the surface before it gets completely attenuated. In the middle is a material with higher electrical conductivity, like a finer grain silty soil. The GPR signal is attenuating, but a little bit of signal makes it back to the surface. We would see this object, but it would be very weak. On the right is unfortunately what many soils are like. They have high electrical conductivity and they absorb the GPR signal quickly. In this case, the GPR energy makes it down to the object and reflects, but then it is completely absorbed before it makes it back to the surface. This object is invisible to GPR. Most GPR practitioners have been in this situation, trying to explain why the GPR did not find the object they were looking for. The culprit is often soils with high electrical conductivity like clay soils. The soil may naturally have high electrical conductivity, such as clay soils, but materials with high electrical con conductivity can also be introduced to the soil. This sometimes happens when they add fill to an area to even out the surface. The native soil in the area may be great for GPR because it has low attenuation and allows the GPR to signal, signal to travel deep. But then you walk across a filled area and the penetration decreases because it has a higher attenuation. I've also seen the opposite situation, bad native soil and the fill that was added is better for GPR penetration. This idea goes along with one of my messages from today, which is GPR can be hard, but don't give up too quickly. Do your due diligence, collect enough data, before you, you give up on, on the technology and for that site. Again, attenuation is caused by high electrical conductivity. And if we look at the culprits here, clay soil can have conductivity up to a thousand decibels per meter. Silts can up to a hundred decibels per meter. Seawater, a thousand decibels per meter. This is attenuation, this is absorption of the signal. Salt water in general has high electrical conductivity. When salt is dumped on the surface, like what happens in Canada every winter to melt ice that forms on our road, that salty water runs off the road into the nearby soil and makes it highly electrically conductive and therefore highly attenuative on the GPR signals. We find in our parking lot, we'll do surveys in our parking lot. And the worst time of year to do that is about April because the water underneath the parking lot that's gone through all the cracks and everything has, has salt in it. And the penetration is very little. And it takes usually until June or July that we've had enough rain that has washed the salt out of the system that we start to see deeper. And you may run into situations like this when somebody has dumped salt on the surface. So as we've seen earlier, and in this image, 
finding coffins in a sandy soil is usually pretty easy. Finding coffins in a clay soil with GPR is more difficult, or simply put, sometimes impossible. Here's an image from a cemetery in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. The soil was not suitable for a signal to penetrate to the top of the coffins. So they are invisible to the GPR. This is not good news, but unfortunately, this is the reality of GPR at certain sites with certain soil conditions. So let's talk about other factors that get involved with detecting coffins and bodies. So let's take the knowledge that we've learned on contrast, reflectivity, and attenuation, and talk more about detecting unmarked graves with GPR. I am not certain how long this process takes, but eventually wooden coffins degrade and collapse in. One of our archeology span customers tells me that when he surveys 19th century cemeteries, nearly all the coffins have collapsed. But from a contrast point of view, think about what happens when a coffin does collapse. Contrast is lost. Detecting the coffin directly becomes more difficult, especially a wooden coffin, which would have similar properties to the soil. The subsidence of the soil in the grave shaft due to the collapse of the coffin can be a feature to look for. There's other technologies that, will, that you can use. LIDAR is another where you may be able to, to spot those little depressions from a, a grave. The subsidence is sometimes filled in with a different soil type, with different properties than the original soil including different properties in terms of water and air content. And these are things that make the grave shaft or can make the grave shaft more visible to the GPR. I have an example of this a little bit later. Let's talk about a body that has buried, been buried with no coffin. Well, scientifically speaking, a human body is not that different than a buried container of water because the human body is 70% water or so. With that in mind, we should expect a buried body to have a high GPR reflectivity. This is data from a research site where pig bodies were buried to study what happens as they degrade and decay and learn how detectable they are with various instruments over time. This GPR survey line was collected shortly after burial. You can see the strong GPR response from the pig's body, which would still retain most of its mass and water. As we expected, the body at this point is very detectable with GPR. It's also a great image that shows resolution as well. There's no way somebody looking at this would know that it is a body, you know, pig's body. There's just nothing in there that gives you the resolution to make that sort of interpretation. It's all context. You're collecting data in the context where you're expecting bodies. And so you're looking for a response, which might be typical for that. Western Carolina University in North, in North Carolina, USA has a human decomposition facility, also known as a body farm. A few years ago to train their forensic anthropology students on the capabilities of ground penetrating radar, Sensors and software was invited to collect GPR data at the facility. We collected grids of data over several buried bodies at the site. This shows some selected lines from one of the bodies. On the left is the GPR line that crossed the body perpendicularly. And on the right is the line that crossed the body along its length. Good examples of what we are saying and what the physics predicts. Strong GPR responses due to the large contrast between the body and the soil. Here's a simple graphic of what happens to a body over time. Bodies decay 
they lose mass and they lose water. As a result, the contrast with the surrounding soil decreases and the body becomes harder to detect. I don't have an example for this, but I think from everything you've seen so far, um, you can imagine what that is. These are weak responses because there's just not the contrast. The situation becomes very much like detecting the rock in dry soil. There's not enough contrast for a strong GPR reflection. And therefore the body is easy to overlook in the data. This is why cold cases are so difficult to solve. Looking for a decayed body after many years is a very difficult target. Bones are small and usually don't provide strong reflections. Add to that the complexities of other objects in the ground, rocks, tree roots, etc. The task is very challenging. Clothing helps to make a body a stronger target for a while but eventually natural fibers degrade. Synthetic fibers last longer and may contain the body mass for a longer period of time. However, after a few years, it's necessary to look for other responses in the GPR data to try to identify a possible buried body. One of those things is GPR reflections from other objects buried with the body that may be slower to degrade. Backpacks, shoes, large belt buckles, et cetera, may provide a response in the GPR data. Mind you, there's no way to differentiate these responses from the responses from natural objects like tree roots, but they can provide a chance. An FBI agent once told me that they'd solved a cold case when they got a tip to search a farmer's field. They dug where they found a strong hyperbolic reflection and they found the murder weapon, a knife surrounded by four bodies. So you just never know. Another thing to look for is the hole that was dug to bury the body. Filled in holes may have different air and water contents. Both materials provide potentially high contrast with the surrounding soil and therefore could provide GPR reflections to help detect the hole. Here's a good GPR example of the disturbed soil associated with a hole. Note the difference between the GPR response on either side of the hole compared to the center. So this does stand out. Again, we don't know what's in the hole. We don't know, you know why it was dug, but we can see that the soil was disturbed in this area because it looks different than the background. And that's another reason why I always encourage people to collect long lines of data if possible. If you're interested in a small area, don't just collect data in that small area. Do a reconnaissance line that gives you kind of the background picture of the entire area so that when anomaly does appear, it's obvious. You can say, you know what? This response looks way different than anything else I've seen in this whole area. And that allows you to focus in on it. Here's an 80 meter long line uh, collected over a number of holes that were dug and filled in. This was part of a police training exercise we did at the Ontario Police College years ago. What it shows is how prominently disturbed soil can be. This line is 80 meters long, almost the length of a football field, but it doesn't take a lot of GPR training to know that if I'm looking for a buried object, there are four places here that I should investigate further. Here's another example from the body farm at Western Carolina University. Again, we are drawn to the body because the depth of the GPR responses from the disturbed soil is anomalous compared to the responses we see elsewhere in the survey area. 
As I mentioned earlier, the soil above graves often subsides due to natural compaction or due to the coffin collapsing. Sometimes, especially in cemeteries, that dip is filled with a different material to level the ground. Different soil with different properties, different water content than the soil below, provides an opportunity for a GPR response that can indicate the presence of the grave shaft. This example shows this. Note the strong, shallow reflection that is about one meter wide. If I see this multiple times and the aerial extent is grave sized, it becomes another way of detecting the grave without imaging the body or the coffin directly. It doesn't happen often, but it's possible to have a situation where the hole is filled with a different material. In that case, we would expect a response similar to the image on the right. Perhaps a difference in the attenuation of the native soil, host soil, and the attenuation in the film material. So that's what we see here. We're getting, in this, in this area, we're getting tremendous penetration where the hole is compared to everywhere else in the area. So note, note the X shape on the top of the GPR section. And I'd like, to, I'd like to explain why we sometimes see that. In this example, we see the same sort of X pattern from the trench. I have an animation that shows why a narrow trench results in an X pattern. It comes down to the GPR signals reflecting from the far side of the trench as the GPR approaches it, crosses it, and moves away from it. When the GPR is on the left side of the trench, it sees the reflection from the boundary below it and on the far side of the trench. The response from the far side of the trench is deeper in the GPR line. As the GPR moves, the far side of the trench gets closer and the reflection moves shallower in the GPR line. When the GPR reaches the middle of the trench, it gets reflections from both sides of the trench and maybe even the bottom. As it moves to the right side of the trench, it now gets reflections from the left side of the trench starting off shallow and getting deeper and deeper as it moves further away. This is what creates the X pattern we see in the GPR data. It's not too common to see this, but it is possible in some situations and would certainly be helpful for locating a possible unmarked grave. Here's an example of a hole that was dug. It disturbed the natural layering of the soil. You can see the obvious V pattern where the hole was dug. So here's the natural soil. You can see this layer in the soil and the hole that was dug broke that up. And of course we see the V in there as well, indicating that uh, somebody has dug a hole that's interrupted this soil layer. So that's another way of spotting where possible holes and you know, consequently possible graves may be located. Let's briefly talk about appropriate GPR systems for trying to locate unmarked graves. On the left is a GPR system with an antenna with a center frequency of 250 megahertz. Some of you will know that GPR systems are ultra wideband devices. So they transmit a wide swath of radio signals. We often refer to them by their center frequency. So we will say it's a 250 megahertz system. Even though there's a broad range of frequencies, it is centered at 250 megahertz. On the right side is a GPR system with an antenna with a center frequency of 500 megahertz. You can see that it is physically smaller in size and that's because the antenna necessary to generate a 500 megahertz signal is physically shorter. And so we can actually make the packaging smaller in size. So these are relatively high frequency GPR systems. 
And that means that the images they produce have higher resolution than the GPR systems with lower frequency antennas, such as 100 megahertz or 50 megahertz. Either of these antenna frequencies are appropriate for the search for unmarked graves. They provide a good combination of depth of penetration and resolution. All the data images that I've shown so far and will show for the rest of this presentation are from one of these GPR systems, either 250 megahertz or 500 megahertz. I'm gonna continue on with GPR, talking about GPR data collection. And I'm gonna skip right over line scan to talking about grid collection. All GPR systems can collect data in a line scan mode. In line scan mode, you collect individual GPR lines. But I hope that we don't have to discuss much why line scans are not appropriate for finding unmarked graves. In GPR surveys for unmarked graves, we usually must cover a large area. And single lines across an area are just not going to cut it. First, your odds of passing right over the grave are remote. And two, recognizing a grave from a single GPR line is very challenging at best. So we're gonna talk about grids, which is the proper way to cover an area. This image shows the idea of a GPR grid survey, collecting data over an area like you are mowing the lawn. Here's a short video of collecting a couple lines in a small five meter by five meter grid to give you an idea of what's involved. So it collects the first line. These lines are actually being collected in the same direction. So he collects the first line, pulls it back to the baseline, and then collects the second line. Yes, it is possible to zigzag. Some of our systems allow you to do that, Noggin and Pulse Echo. Uh, the LMX does not, and I don't think the FindR does. And so there's lots of reasons for that, which I won't get into at this time. Let's just say that data collected in the same direction tends to be easier to process and gives you a better image overall. But here's gives you a taste of, of simple data collection of a grid. Why do we collect grids? The power of grids is the ability to take the parallel grid lines, spaced a certain distance apart, and process them into depth slices. Depth slices are horizontal map images extracted from the grid data at a certain depth. In this example, we see the depth slice of all the GPR data in the depth range from 60 to 80 centimeters. In this image, we see a map image of coffins in graves. These are shown in red. Depth slices are a map of the GPR reflection strength or the reflectivity at a certain depth. Some reflections are weak, shown here in purple, and other reflections are stronger, shown here in red. And then in between, we have colors like light blue and green and that sort of thing. This is obviously, I hope it's obvious, a very powerful way to visualize large amounts of GPR data simultaneously and look for the targets that we're interested in finding. Here's an example of a buried water jug collected at a forensics training course for one of our customers. On the right, you see the strong response in the GPR line at a depth of about three feet. On the left is the depth slice at three feet. The thickness of the depth slice is indicated by the two red lines on the image on the right side. So the actual thickness of the depth slice here is probably, this is in feet, so I'm a little challenged, half a foot or so. So we're looking at about six inches of data with each depth slice. And the depth slice that goes right through this response, we can see we get a very strong red response compared to everywhere else around it, 
which is a very weak response. The depth slice makes the position of the water jug obvious and even provides some coarse information on the approximate size and the depth of the target. We're getting an idea of generally the aerial extent of this object, although be very careful. GPR does not give that to you know, millimeters or that sort of thing. It's again, it's a distorted, blurry image of the subsurface. So all you've got is, is an indicator, not, uh, not a super accurate uh, measurement. Conceptually, here's where we wanna go. We wanna show depth slices in the context of where they were collected. So here's one from a graveyard. Here's, here's the depth slice from two to two and a half feet. And then we slice down deeper and here's the one from three to three and a half feet. Very powerful way of looking at your GPR data. Here's one depth slice showing the coffins at, at depth. These are situations where the data interpretation is easy. We still have to talk about the more difficult situations. So let's look at this same data set as a depth slice animation. And so in this, we're looking from slice to slice, one after the other, and we're going from the surface down. You can see the, the slight break as it rewinds and starts again from the top. So we're slicing down probably at this frequency, we're probably slicing about uh, three inches at a time, probably four slices per foot or so. Um, I'm not sure what that would be in metric, but um, seven to 10 centimeters, I guess, on each slice, something like that. And you can see how we can detect coffins at different depths. We see ones that come out shallow, and then we see the last ones we see are the deepest ones. We see point target. So this thing here is some sort of metallic object that we see over and over again through the whole data set. But we can, can, we can look at this animation over and over again and pinpoint where uh, a bunch of graves or potential graves are for sure. So here's a depth slice superimposed on Google Earth. The red responses show the interpreted graves of African-American slaves in the USA. You can see that they were found in a cemetery, but there are no markers for these graves. No one knew how many graves there were until one of our customers did a GPR survey at the site. And so from this image, you can you know, clearly we can see what looks to be and what is easily interpreted as a series of graves in rows. The other type of display that comes from grids, grid surveys are 3D plots. Here are some 3D images from, uh, from a small survey in a cemetery in the United States. In the final image, the weaker GPR reflections are removed. So the stronger reflections from the coffins are visible in a single view. This is certainly a very powerful way of visualizing your grid data. Here is my favorite type of display for grid data. It takes a minute to get your head wrapped around what you're looking at, but once you understand it, it is great for data interpretation. You are looking at a combination of depth slices and GPR lines together in one view. So we have the depth slice here, and we have the two cross sections. The, the Y cross section is here, the X cross sections are here, and you can actually see on the depth slice where those lines are cutting through. So this line on the right-hand side, the, the Y line is located right here, the vertical red line, and the X line is located here, the horizontal line. So, the reason I like this is if you see a response of interest in the depth slice, you can click on the response and see the, the two GPR lines that cross that object, one in the X direction and one in the Y direction. And that's exactly what we have right here. 
right at this, we see this red response, so we click on it. Now we're looking at the two lines that crossed it. And so we can see the response of the object here in the Y line, and we can see the response of the object here in the X line. Similarly, if you scroll through the X and Y lines, which you can do, and you see a response of interest, you can click on it and see the depth slice through the object. And then you can look at the shape and the aerial extent of, of the response and you know, make your best interpretation. So as much as we would like to solve all our interpretational problems with depth slices and 3D images, going back to the raw data, the GPR cross-section is often necessary to make the best interpretation. Here's another example of the, what we call the 3D preview plot. In this case, the responses in the GPR X and Y lines don't really look like much. If you look at those, we got these responses in here, but it's nothing that you would really may not be interested in. And, and so you might overlook them. However, once displayed as a depth slice, a body sized area emerges from the data and becomes obvious, an obvious target for further investigation. That's this red area in here, which we can see, we can see it linear in this line and just a slight hyperbolic response on this line. Remember earlier that I showed you a plot where the top of a hole may have been filled in with a different material. Because we collected a grid at the site, we can look at adjacent lines and see if we see something similar. Here are two parallel lines showing a similar response at the top of the section. Here and here, we have this high amplitude, shallow response that has a definite aerial extent. And a couple, uh, half a meter away or quarter meter, I'm not sure the line spacing, we see another one and similar response. Now, when we plot the depth slice through these and other lines, look what we get. We see this high amplitude event has an aerial extent to it. Again, very shallow, this is pretty much at the surface, uh, but we can see the shape that it takes. And the shape looks promising if we're looking for a grave. Setting up a grid may sound trivial to many of you with archeological or forensics background, but there are a few important things that we must discuss before we start collecting GPR grids. One of the hardest parts of setting up a grid, especially a large one, is getting it to be square or rectangular and not a parallelogram. You need to make sure that the corners are right angles. Our data collection software makes that easy. Once you decide on the X and Y dimensions of the grid, it calculates the hypotenuse distance for you and displays it on the screen so it's easier to use your measuring tape and square up your grid. Now we have to decide on the line spacing. This is the setting that will determine how much work you are actually going to do. The coarser the line spacing, the less work. The finer the line spacing, the more work. The best GPR grid data is collected using the length of the GPR antenna as the spacing. A 250 megahertz antenna is 30 centimeters or 0.3 meters long. So the line spacing ideally should be 0.3 meters. Or if you wanna make the arithmetic easier, make it 0.25 meters so that it's easier to calculate things. A 500 megahertz antenna is 15 centimeters long. So the line spacing should be 15 centimeters. If you're a purist, you would go with 0.1 meters to make, the, to make it easier. You can also get away with 0.2 meters based on the size of the object you're looking for and have a slight gap in your data. But generally you're trying to avoid the gaps, but let's talk about that further. 
Deciding on line spacing is basically deciding how big of a gap between lines you can live with. For example, if we're setting the grid line spacing for a 250 megahertz system, like I've got here, if you can't live with any gaps, go with a 25 centimeter line spacing. You will actually overlap by five centimeters, but that is a good thing. That way you have not missed anything. If you wanna increase productivity and think that you can get away with it, you can do a half meter line spacing and have a 20 centimeter gap between lines. Many people collect 250 megahertz data with a one meter line spacing. I see it on LinkedIn all the time. It drives me crazy. Um, I wanna point out why this is bad and I will, but first I wanna talk about data collection productivity. Okay, this is a chart, a little bit to absorb here, but let me take you through it. Let's look at collecting a 10 meter by 10 meter grid. So a 10 meter by 10 meter grid is one one hundredth of a hectare. So if you collect that grid with a line spacing of one meter, you are going to collect 220 meters of data and it would probably take you about 15 minutes or so. If you collect that grid properly with a line spacing of a quarter meter, you're gonna end up with 820 meters of data in the end, and it will probably take you about an hour. Now, using that rate of data collection that you can cover about 100 square meters per hour, let's just look at some possibilities here. At this rate, collecting an acre of data, so an acre of data will take about 40 hours at a quarter meter line spacing, 40 continuous hours of data collection. Collecting a hectare of data, 100 meters by 100 meters, would take 97 hours of straight data collection, four days of data collection, again, at a quarter meter line spacing. Now, I was watching a press conference a few weeks ago and Dr. Sarah Bollier from British Columbia. And she said that there is 160 acres of land to search around the Kamloops Residential School. 160 acres is 65 hectares. Using a guideline of about one hour to collect 100 square meters of data, that search will take 264 days of continuous data collection to collect 160 acres. Now, obviously people look at these time requirements and they look for shortcuts to reduce the time. You can see in the table that if you go with a one meter line spacing, the amount of work is reduced by three quarters. It's one quarter the time, which seems pretty reasonable because you know, we've got to be practical, right? Well, you got to be careful. If you're trying to increase the line spacing, you have to look at the size of the target you're trying to detect. There are all kinds of objects buried in the ground and they have different shapes and sizes. You want to collect GPR data across your target as many times as possible. That is how you detect it and that's how you interpret it with confidence. If the object you're looking for is physically very large or long, that is good news as far as line spacing is concerned. In all the cases I show here, the line spacing is adequate. We're getting multiple crossings at a quarter meter, multiple crossings at a half meter, multiple crossings at one meter. And that's because the objects are physically large in size. Let's look what we're looking for. We're looking for graves and potentially children's graves. I think that we could probably have a coffin on the order of one meter, one meter, three and a quarter feet or so in length. So what does that give us in terms of 
grid line spacing. A line spacing of a quarter meter, which would be ideal, would provide us with three or four crossings of a random unmarked grave. A line spacing of a half a meter would provide us with two crossings. A line spacing of one meter would provide us with one crossing at best. Can we detect a grave in a single crossing? I don't think so. One of the ways you find buried objects is to interpret it on multiple lines. That builds your confidence. Seeing it on only one line is a huge disadvantage. Nature can easily produce a GPR response that looks grave-like on one line. More data is always better. So a tight line spacing is always better. One thing that can reduce data collection time by 50% is to only collect lines in one direction, the X direction or the Y direction, but not both. This is easy in cemeteries with headstones because basically you're forced to. If there are no headstones, you have to determine the orientation of the graves. The Christian tradition is coffins are buried with the long axis in east-west orientation. If you know that, if you learn that, or if you somehow can determine that, the amount of data collection can be greatly reduced. If you don't know that, and you don't know the orientation of the graves, you are taking a risk by only collecting data in one direction. You can easily be in a situation where you're trying to identify a grave on a single line, which is never easy. Moving on to a different type of grid collection. Despite 20 plus years of preaching the benefits of grids, a lot of our customers still find them difficult to set up and collect. I would like to offer another type of data collection that can be used to cover areas, pseudo grid surveys. The reason grids are nice is because we know the position of every line that was collected. When it comes time to interpret the data and process the data into depth slices, that is critical. Positioning is absolutely critical. However, another way to position GPR data is to use GPS. Sorry, I accidentally left the sound on on this one. So another way to position GPR data is to use GPS, but we need a good GPS, not one like your phone or a hiking GPS that you buy. So these, these are not cheap. You're getting into thousands of dollars to get the accuracy that you need. But once you have that, now you can collect data over an area and let the GPS position it for you. And this video shows that idea walking back and forth, covering the area, all in one line, just zigzagging back and forth in the area and letting the GPS do the work of positioning it. And this is what you might end up with. Here's the path of a survey. Here's the path of the survey superimposed on, on Google Earth. Here's the survey processed into depth slices. So this can all be done because we've got the positioning and we have software called slice view lines that allows you to take random lines. So lines that are not in an X, Y grid and process them into depth slices. So here's the depth slice from 80 centimeters to 90 centimeters. And here's another one from 1.7 to 1.8 meters. And so in this particular case, we see two linear features running through the data. But here's the thing, these lines are too far apart to map small objects. If we're looking for child-sized coffins, this data was collected too coarsely. And we have to recognize that. You could technically say, you know, if you're the service provider, you could say, yes, I surveyed the area, but you really didn't survey the area properly. You don't have enough density in the data to make a proper interpretation. Here's an example of how a pseudo grid data collection should be done when you're looking for a small object. This was collected by one of my colleagues and took about two hours. 
So he collected 7,000 meters of data, 4.3 miles in about two hours. If you look at the rough area, he did about 1,500 square meters, which is 15% you know, of a hectare or 37% of an acre. So if you look at that rate of data collection, so it's, it's sped up by the fact that you don't really have to stop data collection. You don't have to stop and start lines. You can just keep going. So compared to some of the numbers before of data collection, what this would work out to is he could have collected at this rate an acre in about five and a half hours and a hectare in about 13 hours. But after 13 hours, I think you would be pretty tired because that's continuous data collection. When we process it into depth slices, we have a great image even small objects, you can see these point objects in, in this depth slice. And if we look at the depth slice animation, you can watch this over and over. It's dominated by some linear events going through there that are probably utilities in the area. But we can also see these point targets. And that, you know, if we're looking for graves, it's essentially a point target. It's, it's a small object, maybe a, a few feet, a meter in length. And in this, we see a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of potentials at, at first pass here. Now let's talk about the interpretational challenges. I've, I've painted in some ways, except for the whole thing about attenuation, I painted a pretty rosy picture of looking for unmarked graves, but let's talk about the reality uh, that you're gonna run into. Here's our ideal outcome. The data that this customer sent sent me is spectacular. It's on our website because it's, it's so good. And it really tells a story of, it tells a very successful story. The soil in the area was good for GPR. We got strong reflectivity from the coffins in the area and a depth slice image makes it pretty obvious to anyone that there are more than likely many graves, any many unmarked graves in this area. So the depth slice give us the, the ability to look at large volumes of data in a single sort of view. And we can look for these patterns of high reflectivity or, or even low reflectivity that form a pattern that indicate graves. And I hope for all of you, I hope that the data you collect often turns out like this. However, at least some of the time, you will have the following challenges in interpreting your data. Remember that buried case of water we looked at earlier? In a single cross section, it looked obvious. But when you combine it with all the other lines collected in the grid and then start looking at the data as depth slices, it's not so obvious this is a target of interest because there are many other that look just as strong and just as interesting. This spot right here, it's hard to see with the green arrow, but where I'm pointing at here, that's, that's the water. That's the case of water buried there. So what about all these other objects? They look just as prominent, just as strong. And this is why locating a cold case body is so difficult because there's only one target of interest. And because there's only one target of interest, responses from other objects in the subsurface that are of no interest, they can totally clutter up the depth slice. In conditions like this, which is very common because the ground is generally a complicated place, it is simply not obvious and even so-called experts can't decide whether a target, whether this is a, a target to spend time in investigating further and potentially excavating. And you can see why you're gonna scratch your head. I've got dozens of targets. Which ones do I look at? Which ones do I concentrate on? The advantage of searching for unmarked, for a, basically an unmarked cemetery, that is multiple unmarked graves, is that a pattern may emerge in the depth slice data that does not look natural. It looks man-made. And that increases your confidence that you are actually finding graves. However, even known 
unmarked graves are not a slam dunk. So here's data from uh, Dr. Sharon Deemer from the Memorial University. And it was collected over a known but very old cemetery. So here's what the, um, here's what the area looked like. You can see there, there are some stone markers, some looks like slight stone markers there, but they're not everywhere. And if we look at the data, this is the data that emerged from that. And this is the depth slice, I believe at 1.5 meters. And this is what she wrote to me the other day. She said, I surveyed a site in Newfoundland with many unmarked graves in glacial till. The cemetery is quite old with the earliest graves probably before 1700, but some are from the 20th century, so a broad range. This is a good example of surveying in difficult environments as there are many till covered areas in Canada. The data shows anomalies at 1.5 meters throughout much of the area, but we don't know what the source of the anomalies are as we don't expect many of the burial sites to have metal. A comparison profile outside of the cemetery does not show the lineup of anomalies at 1.5 meter depth. So presumably a lot of these are from, from unmarked graves, but not much of a pattern and, and a tougher and a tougher interpretation. And again, we also have the situation that the till soil has a lot of reflectors in it. There's a lot of probably cobbles and boulders and this sort of thing that are giving us a strong response and therefore differentiating those strong responses from something that may be a potential grave is challenging. There's no question about it. It's, a, it's also, it's a very important to understand that depth slices and 3D views of GPR data are views of GPR signal amplitude or reflectivity. If your target is strong, it will be visible in the plot. Now, some of the responses that we've talked about that may be indicators of a possible grave may not map out well in a depth slice. For example, this disturbed soil section, if we look at it, there are a few strong responses, but not many. So the disturbed soil may not be visible when we look at it in depth slices, and therefore we may overlook a potential grave. I would say that this trench-like feature that we identified earlier in the data may not be visible in the depth slices either. There's really nothing that dominates. Maybe the edges might appear, but there's a real worry that it may not be visible if we're only looking at our data in depth slices. So one way to attack this is to go through your data and add interpretations to possible targets. Strong, weak, it doesn't matter. So let's take this data set and do that. So this one that was 7,000 meters of data, somebody went through that data and added interpretations to every hyperbola and every object of interest. They actually gave them different colors depending on the characteristics of the hyperbola. It looks like the green one, which is a weak response and versus blue ones, which are a stronger response. This, this potential hole dug, we can mark that with an interpretation. We can draw lines, we can draw boxes around interesting features in the data, like we've done here. And when you take all those point interpretations and box interpretations and lines, and you plot them, you'll get something like this. And so this was at 7,000 meters of data with interpretations added to it. Once it's all done, which is admittedly a lot of work, you get a plot like this that shows the patterns of the responses independent of the strength. Weak ones are marked here, strong ones are marked here. So now we know that we're going to ignore the linear responses in this data set because they're likely utilities buried in the ground. But we are going to have a closer look at the clusters of responses, mostly in brown, that may be targets of interest, these little clusters that may be grave-sized or something like that. 
we're going to take another look at those. So here's the thing. Data collection and interpretation take a lot of time. Subtle reflections of grave shafts or disturbed soil can be interpreted, but not practically on a scale of thousands of meters of data. So that's why we have to narrow down the search areas. We have to find ways to narrow down the search areas. So witness, witnesses and survivor input is important to narrow down the size of the areas to survey with GPR. Now, let's talk about that. If we do, we're still gonna have large areas to search. So how do we, and you saw the numbers, one guy walking around with a GPR system is gonna take days, weeks, months to collect the data. So let's talk about speeding things up and some, some strategies. So one way is we have an option for our systems that we call smart sled. And smart sled allows the user to tow the system behind an ATV or other vehicle. And simply this is gonna increase data collection speed and therefore productivity. Inside this, this sled is a GPS that's used for positioning so you know where you are. Of course, you're gonna have problems when you're in the woods and the GPS is not quite as good. Those are the challenges when we're in wooded areas and getting our positioning done when there's things blocking the GPS signal to get accuracy. But this is one possibility, smart sled. Another way to increase productivity is to deploy an array system. That is combine two or more GPR systems together to collect a swath of data in each pass rather than just a single line. Our standard Noggin and Pulse Echo systems can be combined in this way. And, and we call them SPIDAR systems. If you look on our website, you'll see information about SPIDAR systems. And they're really a combination. They're taking our standard products and adding more and more systems, networking them together so that they can collect data simultaneously in wider and wider swaths. So obviously this is a more expensive system, but if productivity is critical, it can be done. Or you can combine an array system with the smart sled idea and collect data with something like this. This is six 500 megahertz systems collecting data simultaneously. The system was used by one of our archeology span customers in Europe for large scale data collection around Stonehenge a few years ago. And it led to new archeological discoveries in that area. There was a lot of press about it. There's a lot, I think Nova did stories about it. There was a lot of uh, media coverage of that. And you know they, they didn't just use GPR technology, they used other technologies as well, but made a whole bunch of new discoveries basically of other objects buried in the Stonehenge area. And, but to answer the question here, this type of data collection with, an, with a, uh, a system like this, an array system, they got to the point where they could easily collect a hectare or more of data a day. Very last slide before my summary here. Last summer, some of you may have heard about the GPR survey done in Faleri Novi, 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 in uh, Italy. An entire Roman city was surveyed using a sensors and software SPIDAR system. And if you watch this animation a few times, the data really speaks for itself. You can see like a um, amphitheater, down in this area here, you can see structures and streets and all kinds of stuff. And so in some ways, this is what needs to be done in some of these searches for unmarked graves in Canada and around the world. So it is possible to do. It's possible to collect detailed GPR data over large sites, but typically it requires the advanced systems like a SPIDAR system. I am finished. I just want to summarize the things that I've been talking about for the last almost two hours. So GPR is one of the geophysical tools that should be used in locating unmarked graves. But it's not a miracle tool. It never works 100% of the time. It has limitations. And so it's not going to work in all areas. 
Soil with high attenuation is going to be the biggest problem. Clutter sometimes makes it hard to differentiate graves from other targets. That can be a problem. It's important to use other knowledge to narrow down the search to key areas for the detailed GPR surveys. Hopefully some of these very large sites can be focused in on, on some key areas and the surveys done there. If you do run a survey, think about the targets, think about the time of year, and think about when you will get the most contrast between the soil and the target. If the soil is water saturated, looking for a dry target is ideal. If the soil is dry, looking for a wet target is ideal. Those are when you're gonna get your maximum reflectivities. Also, data must be collected correctly and with enough density to allow interpreting possible grave responses. This is my biggest fear in the current state in, in Canada is that people are gonna say they've done surveys, but have they done surveys adequately? Does it have the density necessary to spot unmarked graves? We can add GPR interpretations, but remember that when you're looking at GPR data, everything is an interpretation and interpretations are never 100%. So the more data you have to look at, the better, the more confidence you're gonna have in your interpretation. As we've seen in the examples, hopefully this is um, what you've gotten out of, out of this presentation is interpreting GPR data for graves is usually gonna be challenging. Each site will have different variables that affect the data, the soil, the objects you're looking for, the coffins, the, the climate, how wet or dry it is, all these things are going to have an effect. Easy interpretations from depth slices or 3D may not be possible. And so you may have to add interpretations to individual lines and that's gonna take time. And as scientists, we really need to talk about anomalies and targets of interest rather than bodies and graves, because the GPR does not provide that level of detail. I am never gonna go across something and say, there's a body, because I'm probably gonna be wrong most of the time. So I think we need to be aware of the terminology that we're using when collecting uh, data. Now, ground truthing areas of interest by excavating is a way to build confidence in the data interpretation. But because of the nature of what we're doing, we're talking about excavating bodies that may not be an option in, in some cases. I've heard people say that some of the residential school sites, they want to remain as memorial sites and with no excavation. So that is certainly the decision of the local communities are gonna make that decision. And last thing I finish off, mapping large areas like many hectares or acres is, is not practical with a single GPR system, but you can speed things up by towing them, using motor power to increase productivity and perhaps getting into array systems to increase productivity. So that is my presentation for today. That is the webinar on finding GPR graves. So I would like to open it up and if there's any questions, and we'll talk about those. So the pseudo grid need precision GPS. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, the whole idea of the pseudo grid is based on the precision of the GPS. And we have found RTK GPS is way better. Uh, you're getting into the, the you know, centimeter sort of accuracy. Adding GPS data to lines after the fact can be done, but it is basically in our software, we have a start and end. And so it might not be the level of detail that you're looking for. So it's better if you can collect it as your, if you have the GPS and preferably RTK GPS as you're collecting the data. Is there an optimal speed at which the survey should be made? Our systems have a feature called DynaQ. I, I didn't get into the idea of, of stacking data, but stacking data is a way to increase the signal to noise ratio. And stacking data requires time. So what it 
it, it requires you to slow down a little bit. So the optimal speed is when doing a survey is the slowest speed you're willing to go. Because the slower the, you go, the more you can stack, the more you can increase the signal to noise ratio, and therefore the deeper you can see, and the more you can um, augment the, the signals that are coming back in. And so you can, like typical speeds on this, like you saw the speed with the, um, with the smart sled. Um, I would think you don't want it. 10 kilometers an hour, 20 kilometers an hour are, are okay for data collection. If you want to increase the quality, go five kilometers an hour, something like that. So there's really no optimal. You know, you could run tests when you get to the site and see how good does the data look when I go 20 kilometers an hour versus 10 kilometers an hour versus five kilometers an hour, and then make a decision uh, on what speed seems to provide the best looking data. Somebody is asking about data collection, uh, grid data collection. And yes, it is true. The LMX 200 uh, only collects data in one direction when you're collecting a grid. So it actually forces you to, um, it forces you to go back to the baseline and start line two and then walk back to the baseline and do line three. The LMX 200 is also limited in grid size to a 15 meter by 15 meters. So that's the largest grid that you can do with that, with that system. And so therefore walking back 15 meters is not usually a big deal. People get bent out of shape about not having the zigzag capability, but, but um, I haven't shown you any slides of it. It is very easy to make mistakes when you zigzag. And the biggest one is usually your odometer wheel not being properly calibrated. And if the odometer wheel is not properly calibrated, it's not measuring distances correctly. And what that results in is in the data is something called the herringbone effect. You get this, you get responses that should be linear, but they, they zipper, they jump from side to side and they look terrible and they're very difficult to interpret. And when you go back and you, if you collect the data all in the same direction, even if your odometer is not calibrated correctly, you are still going to get a very workable image. The positions may not be exactly correct, but you can, you can easily correct for that mistake by stretching the data to the correct distance. And so while it may seem like irritating that we don't allow you to zigzag with the LMX 200, it's actually to save people a lot of work. I'm concerned about how well the equipment will work in uneven ground or long grass. Our systems are designed for rough terrain. Yes, you can drive fast enough to you know, bounce them around and that sort of thing, and you do want to avoid that. But uh, long grass and that sort of thing, we collect data like that all the time. Our customers collect data like that all the time. Uneven ground is, you know, it depends on how uneven. If you're on the order of, of six inches up and down in a, over the distance of a meter, if you pardon the mixed units there, I would still use a GPR system on that site because you may not get perfect ground coupling with the antennas at every single trace, but you'll probably get enough to produce a decent image of the subsurface, something that is interpretable. So I would not, it would have to be a very rough terrain before I would even say, I'm not even going to do GPR on this. Now, you also have to think about if the terrain is that rough, did they really bury bodies on that? Terrain. That's another question entirely. If, if you lose GPS signal, the way our software works is that it interpolates signal between when it all the signals that it has. So if, if you have a dropout between, two, say you go five meters and the GPS drops out, it's going to use the last point that it got successfully and it's going to interpolate the positions in between those. So oftentimes when you are collecting data, you are running in a relatively straight line. So that's not usually a problem. Now, if your GPS drops out as you go around a corner, might have issues there, but, but generally, you know, GPS is obviously important. The positioning is important. We do everything we can to use uh, the GPS data that we have. And there are ways of, um, of correcting it. Somebody was talking about 
using other geophysical mapping techniques. And absolutely, um, I, I really don't think that that um, GPR should be used on its own. Uh, I think there has to be other technologies used. Now, my expertise is on GPR and the topic today was on GPR for this particular application. So that's why the whole concentration was on, on GPR. But um, I think if you look at it, you need, I think you need to look at other types of geophysics to combine the data sets to give the best possible interpretation. And I'm not familiar with geoelectric, but if it can find graves, then, you know, by all means, um, I would complement the GPR data with, with other geophysical techniques as well. There's a question about stacking that just came in. You might want to answer that. Can you explain to us how it's collected method by static measurement or mobile like the 250? I just might actually have a slide for that. This is kind of what ultra stacking is all about. Okay, so this is kind of what happens when you're using uh, one of our devices with the ultra receiver. And so, for example, if you're, we didn't talk about step size, but step size is the distance between sample points on the ground. And at, in this case, it's five centimeters. Um, at a 250 megahertz system, it'd be five centimeters. For a, a, for a Noggin Ultra 100 system at 100 megahertz, you would typically do a 10 centimeter to maybe 25 centimeter step size. And here's what happens is as the system is rolling along in the gap between zero and let's call it 10 centimeters. Say you're doing a step size every 10 centimeters. As it's rolling along between zero and 10 centimeters, it is stacking the data as many times as it can. The, the system is pulsing, it's sending energy into the ground. And in the end, by the time it hits the 10 centimeter mark, it may have say 30,000 traces. And it takes those 30,000 traces and it combines them all into one average trace. And then it does the process again for the next 10 centimeters. And this kind of shows the process, uh, this animation, but in here it's only showing, I think five, four or five traces being collected. But the ultra receiver will collect tens of thousands. And, and, and the main difference is that the system is that much faster. So whereas before we would collect dozens of traces, now we collect thousands of traces. And what that does is, as I say, once you stack it up that high, the signal to noise ratio increases and therefore you see much, much better. And here's another, you see much deeper. And so here's an animation, if I can get it to play, that kind of shows that idea. At low number of stacks, you cannot see this particular object. But as you get up into the hundreds of stacks and into thousands of stacks, now this metal sheet, uh, which was a known target at a known depth, uh, becomes visible. So anyway, I hope that answers your question about um, the ultra receiver. Good question about uh, bush. So thick tree bush and thick trees that have grown up since the time of the residential schools site. Uh, <clears throat> challenging site. Um, all you can do is collect the data as, as best you can, either around. Um, I, I don't know this particular situation. I don't know whether it's at all practical to say, you know, can we, can we remove the vegetation so that uh, we can do a proper GPR survey? If that's not possible, then you just have to do the best data collection that you can, which is admittedly very challenging. And the toughest thing will be positioning. And so, you know, by, by its nature, the vegetation is gonna block the GPS if, it, if the trees are large enough. And so you may end up having to do your positioning with, you know, literally tape measures and grids and that sort of thing. That's really the only way um, to get the proper positioning in the data. Polarity changes to constrain material interpretation uh, a little bit. You can, yes, if you, if you look at the signal, you, you can look to see where, which signals are 
uh, a positive re reflection coefficient and which ones are a negative reflection coefficient. And you may be able to make um, inferences about composition and that sort of thing. It's it's done a little bit. It's it's I we don't do it an awful lot. I, I don't typically teach that uh, when we do training because it is tricky. It's really tricky. You have to know the pulse of the signal. You have to know the polarity of the signal in order to look for the inverse signal and that sort of thing. And so it's easy to get tripped up on that one. Um, so it's not something that I do an awful lot of. I, I think for the most part, people are happy to find an object and locate where it is and locate how deep it is. Um, if you're trying to determine composition, then you know, you're into a whole other realm. Okay, so we're out of questions. So I think that we're done for today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned something from the presentation. Please keep in touch if you, if you have questions. If you think of something in the next few days, send us, send us an email and we'll, get, we'll answer you as best we can. Okay, thank you for your attendance today.